G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to Pole Position with Guardian Australia and Essential Media, where we give you the inside story on what's going on in Canberra and what the public actually thinks, not what the pollies say they think. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that Canberra is Ngunnawal country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded here and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The days and times for our webinars do vary, so make sure you head on over to the australiainstitute.org.au to sign up for uh, some exciting future webinars that we've got coming up next week and in the following weeks. And just a reminder that it is the end of financial year appeal for the Australia Institute. We love doing these webinars. We provide them um, totally for free to the public because we want to invite you all into this conversation and um, share great ideas and great thinkers with you. But it's not free to put on. So if you can chip in anything, every dollar helps. And between now and June 30th, every dollar will be matched dollar for dollar, thanks to two generous donors. So you can head on over to our website if you can uh, chip in, if you're in a position to. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who's joining us from The Guardian and Australia at Home. And just before we kick off a few tips, uh, there's a Q&A function where you should be able to type in questions for the panelists for later. Uh, you should be able to comment and upvote on other people's questions as well. Please keep things civil and on topic uh, in the chat or we'll boot you out. And a reminder, even though Zoom gives you one as well now, <laughs> that this is being recorded. And you can head on over to Australia Institute TV for recordings of this and all our previous poll positions as well as our webinars as well. Make sure you subscribe to get all the latest uh, from that. So <clears throat> joining us again today is Catherine Murphy, the political editor at Guardian Australia, Pete Lewis, executive director at Essential Media, and Richie Merzian, the director of the Australia Institute's Climate and Energy Program. And this week's Essential Poll gets into climate change, uh, our relationship with the US and China, and who or what Australians blame when we have COVID outbreaks. So there's plenty to get into. We'll go in that order. But before we dig into these numbers, we have seen Catherine, another political leader toppled in Australia in the last day. Barnaby Joyce successfully challenged for the leadership of the Nationals, deposing Michael McCormack, taking the leadership again after Barnaby resigned a few years back in the wake of allegations of sexual harassment. Uh, allegations which he denies, but it seemed to me that what sparked it all off with, was the suggestion, not from our, even our own Prime Minister, but from a foreign Prime Minister, that Australia might possibly sign up to a net zero by 2050. Yes. Uh, well, apparently we've already, we've already declared for that. Yeah, if apparently, we, yes. yes. If we quote Boris Johnson um, in, a, in a, a completely delightful rose garden, which I gather is in the back of number 10, uh, if you watch politics closely, you may have seen that press conference where the British Prime Minister uh, raised Australia's level of ambition for Scott Morrison by saying that we had, in fact, declared for net zero when, of course, we've done no such thing. Um, look, uh, climate is sort of uh, part of this story, Ebb, and a convenience deployed within the story, if that makes sense. Uh, the fact is Barnaby Joyce has wanted his old job back since the moment he left it uh, and has engaged in a constant campaign in order to return to the leadership. And uh, his return to the leadership is simply the culmination of that campaign. If it had not been climate, then another trigger would have been used. Why did it happen? Uh, well, it happened uh, in this week, because this week is the last week before the, uh, the parliament rises for the winter. And even though Scott Morrison is flat out telling us all the time that he intends to go to the people sometime next year rather than this year, there's a bunch of people in the government, including many in the Nationals Party room, who don't believe that. So they, they basically were faced with an option where if they were going to move against McCormick and reinstall Barnaby Joyce, then this was the final week they had to do it. Uh, they also, uh, Barnaby Joyce reached a point where he did in fact have the numbers to replace McCormack, which has been the missing element over the you know, three or so years that this fairly boring saga, to be frank, has, has played out. So uh, he had the numbers, there was a finite window of time to move. So he moved 
and uh, one of the the trigger points that were that was sort of developed as a case against Michael McCormick was uh, the Liberals pushing ahead with a climate pivot that the Nats are not on board for, and so we see the the sort of lethality of climate change move from Labor leaders to Liberal leaders now to National leaders. Yeah, um, Pete, in your column today, I really, I really can't get past the beginning of it. I loved this language. While the Prime Minister is holed up at the lodge in quarantine, his coalition partners have been infecting the body politic with a new Delta strain of climate denial by restoring Barnaby Joyce to the second highest office in the land. What does the Guardian Essential Poll tell us about the national mood on climate change? Is it as Barnaby Joyce would have us believe? It's really interesting. We'll go into the um, into the time series of questions um, in a second, but the reality is that the climate, uh, the prosecution of climate, has been out of step with the Australian public really for the last decade and a bit. It's not about convincing the Australian public that a climate change is real and action is required. It's basically been majority support for both these propositions since John Howard was Prime Minister. It's always been about, and then so what? And it's always been about mobilising forces to frustrate the action that the Australian public wants to see. And, you know, my read of Barnaby's return is this is really bad for Morrison because you can see he is trying to slow walk Australia into the global consensus. A, because there's a huge risk if we are, you know, the climate, you know, South Africa of the, the, the 21st century, but also because I just think that from where they are at the moment, just continually weaponising this issue is starting to have more risk than reward for, for the coalition. So... I think for Morrison, um, having an inept National Party leader in Michael McCormick, who couldn't put two words together, was actually helpful for him in this recalibration, which is shifting the language from building new coal to, to gas and then opening the way to some form of maybe kind of if 2050 zero target. Now, I just think having Barnaby back in the game will just weaponise the whole thing again and create a whole bunch of noise in the same way that Fitzgibbons is, is, is really detracting from Labor's strategic play to hold things together. I think for the coalition, they are trying to do something nuanced at the moment. Like every government wants to end up occupying the centre ground. And I just think that, that, that Barnaby's presence is going to make that a whole lot harder. Yeah. Um, so do you want to take us into the first couple of slides that we've got there, Pete? Yeah, I will give it a crack because um, as uh, long, um, long-term long viewers of um, our polling knows, this is, takes about three bits of um, tech um, competence. But this is one of my favourite graphs we've got. This goes all the way back to November 2009 and tracks the Australian public's you know, attitudes towards a couple of statements. Climate change is happening and caused by human activity or we are just witnessing a normal fluctuation of the Earth's climate or don't know. Um, as we can see, you know, you start back, yeah, there's been some highs and lows. You can almost pick the troughs in terms of um, leadership challenges. So, you know, the first one drops, the green line drops below 50 into the 40s, um, when there is the, the, the change in leadership of the Liberal Party um, to, to Abbott and the change in Labor leadership and that dynamic. Um, then you've got the, it's almost like there's a, there's a resurrection up until the point where um, Turnbull takes power, um, the green line's back high again, it dips off again um, once Morrison um, takes the job. At the moment, though, 56% of Australians buy the, the argument that it's happening and caused by human activity. And at reasonably low levels, I think only December 2016 it was lower, 27% um, um, you know, preferring the flat earth variety of um, analysis, and but it also quite a high don't know. So if you, if you were... Listening to the public debate about climate, you'd probably think you're talking about a 50-50 proposition. It's just not. It's two to one 
Australians accept that. Now, we'll just do one more before I throw it Yeah, I was going to say, I thought the next one um, on mm. not doing enough is really interesting. Yeah, so this one's back to December 4, um, 2014. So, um, again, what do we see here? The not doing enough really peaked um, around the bushfires, you know, like so there's always those external external events that push those narratives on. It dropped, it, it went down and you could see it going month by month during the pandemic that the concern was dropping, but it's kind of pushing back up, but it's still at historical low levels that the government's not doing enough. And yet it's still, you know, the lines almost met, didn't they, at the end of last year. Yeah, and Pete, um, I might just get you to skip to the next one as well, because you were just talking about the two to one there. Uh, oh, and this it's one, if, if, yeah, indeed. And if this is the debate, um, new coal fired, um, you know, because that's the only thing that apparently a government needs to do to save rural Australia, um, about 15% support, much, you know, not much more for gas fired as, you know, investing in the energy transition. If push comes to shove, um, renewable is at a five, five to one preference. So, you know, I, you take all those three slides together and you just say, not that things are moving a lot. There's been a bit of nuance through the years of the pandemic, but it's still overwhelming support for the government to get its act together. And back to my Guardian piece, I just think that the, the external now with the Biden administration means it's a lot harder just to hold back the tide on that. Yeah, Pete, I might get you to come back out of the slides for a second there. Catherine, is that your reading of it too, that, you know, the public's still way far ahead? There's now more international pressure, but now the domestic politics are kind of worse. Yeah, well, that's it's not a bad, that is not a bad summary. Um, look, it, I think uh, that uh, what that data shows us is that uh, there's a certain amount of falling off of uh, front of mind consciousness for climate action during the pandemic. I think we would expect that because mm. during a pandemic and the first recession in 30 years, people's material well-being comes to the fore. It's not like that they just woke up and thought climate change wasn't happening. It's just their order of priority shift. So I don't think we should be surprised about that. Um, I think... Uh, Pete's observation that the election of Joe Biden has been genuinely game-changing, dreadful cliche, but true, is correct. There, Biden has brought America back into Paris. That has triggered a sequence of international commitments and actions, which has galvanised a process that had Donald Trump won the election would have been completely moribund. So... Uh, so, yeah, Biden's reframed the international discussion. Australia is certainly coming under pressure in uh, international fora about our lack of ambition in climate policy. That is an ongoing problem, and the government will collide with it most directly at the COP26 uh, talks in Glasgow later this year. Uh, so there's that. Um, in terms of, though, where the government's placed, I agree in the broad with Pete that... Uh, Part of the reason that Morrison has embarked upon the, the pivot is international pressure and also domestic pressure in the sense that there is this stable majority now for climate action and has been for a long period of time. But in relation to this issue, though, I think we need to bear in mind that it's not a simple national majority that we need to look at in terms of how this plays out in an election calculation. It's where various individuals are clustered by way of electorates that determines how Australian, how, you know, whether Australia takes action on climate or not. So uh, while these figures explain why Morrison is trying to crab walk away from the decade of wrecking vandalism and destruction that the coalition has imposed on the Australian public in this area, I mean, their, their, their behaviour is, I have no words for their behaviour. But and they're trying to move away from it, but still the whole dynamics of weaponization haven't gone away. And I think we need to bear that in mind. And that's an important corrective on polling like this that tells us there's a, there is a clear majority in favor of climate action. What matters in Australia is where those people are located, mm. how they vote, 
because elections in Australia are very close. So, which brings us in a way back to the return of Barnaby Joyce. Uh, you know, Joyce is sort of narrow casting to a particular type of voter. Uh, and uh, and he, he speaks directly to uh, a, a type of voter, male voter at risk of voting Labor, a bit like the Prime Minister does. So, uh, I think the sort of picture here is a bit mixed, quite honestly. Um, at one level, at the, at the sort of helicopter level, Morrison's trying to execute a pivot and Barnaby Joyce will make that harder. Um, at the electoral level, though, I think the return of Barnaby Joyce sets us up for an election dynamic, a bit like the election dynamics we've had in the past several campaigns. And I don't want to depress us all on this, on this call, but I think there is a distinct element of back to the future about the whole business. Yeah. Richie, I want to come to you now. Um, before we, I guess, come back to the domestic politics, if I can stick internationally for a bit there, Catherine was talking about the kind of pressure that the Prime Minister is facing internationally and why he's trying to crab walk away from avoiding any action whatsoever. Um, but can you just kind of talk to us about what that international pressure looked like at the G7 and kind of what's coming down the pipeline? Yeah, you had probably the most ambitious G7 position on climate that we've had to date. So Biden has certainly led the charge there. And it, preceding that was his climate summit that uh, the prime minister spoke at without announcing anything new. But all G7 members have locked in at zero by 2050. They've all increased their short-term targets to 2030. Um, the US leading the way by at least halving its emissions. Uh, Canada increased its to around in the 40s. Uh, Japan to, to 46%, uh, EU 55%, UK 68%. All of them have really upped the ante. They've all moved away from financing coal overseas as well. So you saw ambitious positions being brought to the table. You saw ambitious language for G7, at least, put into the communique. And then Australia sitting on the margin, not necessarily associating with that, but then looking at how it can position itself so it doesn't get too firmly in the sights of its key allies, whilst at the same time not putting its domestic constituents offside as well. It's this awkward position, um, but it ultimately played out okay. Unfortunately, that pressure that many of us hoped would be brought to bear didn't really uh, come to fruition, and uh, Australia didn't put anything new on the table at the G7. And just before we, um, Pete, I'll come to you next to get a couple of those slides from the poll. But Richie, um, coming down the line from the EU is things like carbon border adjustment taxes and things like that. How bad is the pressure going to get before COP? Uh, it will continue to build. We'll have this drumbeat of meetings, just the G7 being the next one. Uh, you'll have hopefully the Pacific Island Forum uh, take place, which is always difficult for Australia. The UN General Assembly, um, which does a lot on climate. The G20, which Italy is hosting right before COP26. Each one will continue to push this issue and, and require Australia to front up and at least defend its position. Uh, but what, what's particularly interesting, it's not just carrots and incentives to bring Australia to the table. We're seeing more in the form of sticks, more in the form of stronger languages. So the EU is bringing forward a carbon border adjustment mechanism, a proposal that the EU Commission will actually deliver on the 14th of July for EU countries in the parliament to consider. Now that will, you know, the Australia doesn't have a lot of goods that it trades with the EU, but the EU is really leading the charge. And we know that the US, Canada, Japan, Korea are all looking at the EU proposal as well as the UK as the potential model to form a climate club. Now it's not a proposal they want to go to, but it is a measure of last resort as a way of protecting their own interests because you can't hit net zero by 2050 while still carving out sectors of your economy and giving them free carbon permits. So for the EU and others to actually hit those goals, they need to include those sectors uh, and then make sure that any competing goods coming into their economies also face a similar carbon price. So it's necessary for them to meet their targets. And ironically, it'll mean that Australia could face a tax brought on from the outside rather than from the in. So it's a serious contention. And we see in the essential poll today that 59% of, of Australians uh, believe that Australia shouldn't be locked out. Ah, thanks, Pete. There it is, the last one there. 59% uh, if you look at those that strongly agree and somewhat agree, believe that Australia can't afford to be locked out of the EU or other trade groups um, because it's lacking a net zero by 2050 target or an equivalent target to drive that ambition. 
Yeah, Pete, do you want to take us um, through through that slide and some of those um, propositions yeah. there? As long as I haven't stuffed it up, um, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, so th this is really our risk and reward slide. So, um, and really riffing off, I guess we write these stories before the event. So we're sort of trying, John, to, to, to sort of predict what's going to happen as it's happening. But that, as Richie said, that 59 figure, which is combining the, the dark blue and the light blue, strongly agree and somewhat agree on the um, proposition that Australia cannot afford to be locked out of the EU or other trade markets. Richie's totally right. There, there is now, this is no longer just a belligerent, well, it's not our role. It's potentially going to have consequences. And once those consequences start being anchored down to real communities who aren't being able to trade with different parts of the world, I think it becomes a different, a, a different proposition. But also really strong support for those more positive messages. Um, businesses have the opportunity to develop expertise in renewables. Um, that other countries will demand. 67% of people are up for that story, only 10% are closing their ears. And what really, while, while you know, 60 odd plus on any um, proposition um, gives you a sense it's it's got support. It's when you see only very low um, uh, responses in the other camp that you think, well, these are these are arguments that, that, that are winning arguments. Um, and. Yeah. It's not that they haven't been rolled out before either. We know that, but I think in the as we said, the change context really opens up some real opportunities there. Yeah, Catherine, um, I was really struck. We had Matt Keane uh, in New South Wales. I think picking up some of the language that's in this poll here, focusing on the opportunities for regional Australia and really having a crack at the nationals for holding things back that you don't see anyone doing federally. Um, I mean, the states have been leading the way on a lot of things, but did that strike you as, as significant along with that um, EV announcement? I think uh, certainly Matt Keane uh, has played uh, a really important role at the state level because, as you say, Ev, the, state, the states are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, Keane's, uh, Keane's interventions are significant at a couple of levels. One, he's very honest. He says, we've stuffed this up. My side of politics has stuffed up this debate in past we've been on the wrong side of it and now we need to get on the right side of it which is actually an honest account uh, and that is that degree of transparency is lacking as you say at the federal level although there are a lot of voices around the liberal party who uh who will will uh, will push back hard i think against any effort by the nationals to uh, to basically disrupt morrison's pivot i think we'll see some pressure at this end depending on where all of the Nat stuff wash out. So yes, it is important. I think what Keane is saying is, is very important. Uh, and, uh, and what the states are doing is also important. It's, it's the thing that's sort of keeping climate action ticking over in a, during a long period at the federal level where policy has been a near disaster. There's just one more point, just looping back to Richie before we get off this that I just wanna make, uh, just in terms of the EU, um, uh, Last week, Australia signed a free trade agreement with Britain uh, and trumpeted that free trade agreement as being magnificent. And of course, it is important and it gives agricultural access to the British market, something that's very difficult to get access for uh, Australian commodities in the Northern Hemisphere. But actually, for all the sort of championing of the, of the British FTA, the European free trade agreement is much more important to Australia than Britain because it's a much bigger market. So mm -hmm. this is where the Europeans actually do have some leverage over Australia. We want access to the European market and we want uh, the, the UK FTA to be a pace setter for that access because it's even harder to get agricultural um, commodities into the European market than it, than it has been to get them into the British market. So this is a genuine point of leverage. It's not an abstract seminar. So, and I think part of the, the, again, part of the underpinning of the pivot has been uh, this consciousness that, that Europe will push this if, if need be. So anyway, it's just, it's very interesting, all these little pieces of the jigsaw puzzle internationally, just at the moment. Yeah. Pete, do you want to take us to the next one about Australia's diplomatic and trade yeah. relationship? Yeah, I think the next series really reinforces what Catherine's saying, that there is really a state of flux at the moment in and look at to the right-hand bar here. So this is a question where we're asking people, do, do they think 
um, in terms of our diplomatic and trade relationships, um, whether they want to see Australia working more closely or less closely um, or staying the same. Um, now, we all want to be closer to New Zealand, that's a given. Um, there seems to be a fair amount of um, support there for the United Kingdom as well. But then the United States, um, where the numbers in the last couple of years have obviously been heading in a different direction, um, and then you've got China, where half the population are saying, let's get further away. And that's in the context of a, a kind of an, a narrative, I think, that says that um, there is a real risk to our economy um, with the China um, trade sanctions. There's still real scepticism and growing scepticism. I might take through the next couple of slides just to yeah, sort of thanks. throw all that on the table, because I think it does tell an interesting story. Influence of the US. Um, you know, do you think, do you rate the influence um, on each of the following aspects as positive or negative? You know, one of the stories here is that even through the Trump era, um, you know, there was still majority support for a relationship with, with the states, which, um, you know, is hardly um, news, but um, maybe a little bit counterintuitive. But then you can see the big drop off in the same period, um, particularly around trade and um, Chinese corporations operating in Australia where support is basically halved. Um, the final question, and I think the one that really nails the shift over the last couple of years is this forced choice question we put to people over um, a number of surveys, which is, you know, if you had to choose um, which of the two, United States or China, do you want to see more effort being put into? And as you can see, back in August, 2019 it wasn't line ball but 38 28 it was really a conflicted story but again um with the biden administration the 38's gone to 57 um the, the those wanting you know as a priority to strengthen the relationship with china even in the um context where that relationship is in trouble has halved so you know you know Looking at polling as a mixture of science meets art. The science says that something's going on in our relationship with China. Our job is to fill in the gaps and see, see what else is there. Um, I was going to see if John, who's you know works behind the engine, has picked anything else up in the cross tabs on these. I don't know if I want to put you on the spot, John, if that's okay. Before we go back to the crew as well. Yeah, sure. So there's a little bit in there. So um, we do see a um, partisan um, split here between coalition and labour voters. Coalition voters more likely to favour United States, 69% of them, compared to 55 Labour. We also see Greens voters most likely to support a relationship with China, 24% compared to 11% of Coalition, 16% wow. of Labour. And that's also tied to an age factor as well. We see older people have more positive um, perceptions of the relationship with the US, younger people, China. Thanks, John. Um, Catherine, I'll come back to you there. Obviously, there's been kind of huge ructions in the relationship with China. As I would have thought people would want to mend that, but those polling results perhaps suggest people think we're better off to just cut our losses. Um, you know, kind of wasn't that long ago that the Prime Minister was talking about negative globalism. He certainly seemed to have changed his tune by the time he got back to the G7. Um, you know, where do you think things go from here in terms of he couldn't even get a one-on-one -on -one relationship, uh, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Joe Biden, and that's where everyone, you know, seems to want to take our relationship a bit stronger? Yeah, well, it's it, it's really challenging times. I'm not saying that just in some offhand, you know, sort of one of those things you say. It is it is genuinely challenging times uh, for Australia and the world. Um, I think uh, the the thing that's changed in uh, the perception in Australia in terms of China has been obviously the rise of a much more authoritarian regime in the country and uh, the sort of uh, hegemonic ambitions of the much more authoritarian regime are, are there for all to see. And, uh, and the coalition does like a political conversation that is sort of heavily laced with security, national security, our place in the world and also people's assessment of China has been super well that well the, the the pandemic's been an accelerant I guess for pre-existing uh cautions in the geostrategic environment 
So look, I think Morrison says we're sort of in the most dangerous time since before the Second World War, and I, I don't think that's an overstatement. It, it, we are in we are in really difficult geostrategic times. In terms of how Australia balances its relationship between our most important economic partner, which is China, and our most important security ally, which is America, uh, well, this is a work of work in progress on both counts. I think. Uh, Australia is sort of, uh, didn't really want things to escalate to a new Cold War level in terms of the relationship with Beijing, but some of that was taken out of Australia's hands and some of that was accelerated by Australia's messaging. And then we get into sort of forming bonds with a new administration. Morrison prided himself on keeping the dialogue between Australia and America open during the Trump regime, which uh, a lot of European countries is kind of backed away from America ever so slowly and didn't want to lean into that relationship during that period. But Morrison prided himself on keeping Australia at the table during that period, which in a way I think might explain the fact that sentiment by Australian voters about America held up even during the Trump period, which as Pete says is a bit counterintuitive. So uh, anyway, Morrison's got some work to do to establish a good relationship with Biden and the new administration in Washington. And Biden has been very clear that climate change is one of his major priorities, both domestically and internationally. So Australia is going to have to find a, a, a glide path there that isn't actually obvious. And in terms of China, well, what the hell do we do about China? Can I just say, Catherine, looking at those numbers, there's a real chance that someone's going to weaponize those sentiments in the lead up to the next election, I would have thought. Um, and it'll be economically self-defeating, but potentially hugely politically rewarding. Yeah, well, we, we see elements of that debate in prospect presently. Mm -hmm. We can see some of that messaging being worked up presently. Sorry, Eva, I'll, I'll just say this quickly. We see a, a pep in Peter Dutton's step. We do see a pep in the step. Uh, and Peter Dutton, this is absolutely in the pocket of territory he likes to prosecute. But it is complicated though, Pete, the only thing I'd say very quickly is weaponizing that you can see, you know, the groundswell of, of, of opinion that would allow you to weaponize that. However, Australia is a very diverse country. It's a migrant country. And again, a bit like climate change, you know, what works as a national message doesn't always work mm. at the electoral level. So it's a bit bit more complex than just being able to go as we would as I might call it full Dutton I think it's I think it's a bit more complex than that yeah Richie I might come to you just on the US and its climate ambitions um you used to work at DFAT how significant is it that the PM couldn't get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the US president it's really awkward um but just riffing off what what Murph and Pete were saying like that inf that confluence of the China sort of bashing, I guess, and our negative globalism and the marginalization of Australia on climate has sort of come together in this weird way this morning around the UNESCO decision, the draft decision to list the Great Barrier Reef. When I was at DFAT like six, seven years ago, right next to me was the task force, like a whole, a whole team that his sole job was to make sure the Great Barrier Reef wasn't listed uh, as endangered. And so they were spent like a whole year lobbying UNESCO members to make sure that didn't happen. So this has been a real concern for DFAT and the government for years. There was no blindsiding by having that listed. It's just Australia's reputation has just been so poor on the international environmental stage that it makes it much easier for other countries to actually push for Australia to be singled out. So that's kind of one example this morning. The other being that the fact that Scott Morrison hasn't met Joe Biden. The first opportunity was on the margins in, in a pull aside at the G7. And instead, you know, the, the plus one comes along in the form of Boris Johnson and media weren't invited. And so the only thing you could do is, is see a trilateral instead of a bilateral, like having someone bring someone else on a date doesn't make it a date anymore. It becomes this weird social gathering. And that's what happened. And without media there, you're not sure exactly what was discussed, but you know that Australia is facing a US that is putting climate front and center, climate and trade, 
The UK did a big review of its foreign policy and is putting climate front and center as well. And so there would have been some awkward conversations there on climate at least, as well as others on China and otherwise. So it doesn't look good that we can't book a date with our key ally and key partner. And instead we get rolled into this weird friendship group. That's quite striking language, uh, Richie. I, I like that analogy. Um, Pete, before we go to questions from the audience, can you just take us through those last couple of slides on the quarantine uh, questions? So we've had the outbreak in Victoria, uh, potentially numbers not looking good in Sydney at the moment. Um, what does the polling say about who people or what people blame for these outbreaks? Um I'm really hoping this is going to come up on the screen and not some of my other work. Um, I think that's... Uh, yeah, hold on, hold on. This good. might be it. We got it? Hang on. I can't see that. Screen has stopped the shared screen. Views towards Victorian COVID. Otherwise, I'll just read it out to you. Yeah. Is that coming yeah. up okay or not? No, I can't see that. But, yeah, I was okay. going to ask, um, you've got 59% there that agree the COVID-19 outbreaks. Yeah, there we go. In okay. due to the fact that they're not purpose-built or designed. Yeah, yeah, and you can see the shift around the outbreaks and also God knows what's going to happen up here in Sydney. It's been a double-digit day today. I think this is the one that really shows where the Australian public's at and whether it's a particularly, you know, we, we forced a choice of where we want fo focus to be, um, but purpose-built quarantine, 65% is obviously what's going to make the, the vast majority of people feel confident that um, the government's got their backs. Um, I suspect that there will be through winter and maybe even through spring, um, you know, skirmishes and, you know, mini lockdowns or longer lockdowns. And I think there is a real risk for the government that they haven't really done the work um, around quarantine and they've, um, you know, really focused on hotel. Um, home doesn't have that, isn't seen as a silver bullet either. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of thing where government's actually got to go and do stuff and make things. And um, I think one of the, the, the areas where the government risks being exposed is that while they, to their credit, held the show together last year, there are things that you'd think were probably could have been done around vaccines and quarantine that haven't been. Yeah, um, I wonder if you can, yeah, come out. Thanks, Pete. And uh, Catherine, just quickly coming back to you before we go to the first questions. There's been, a, I think, a bit of a renewed focus around why the government wasn't able to secure deals or didn't secure deals with Moderna and um, Pfizer that were offered um, early on in the picture. And now, AstraZeneca seems to be, you know, just more and more risky or perceived that way by the population. You know, just how much trouble is the government in here? Oh, this is this is a genuine debacle, I think, on the vaccine quarantine side. Uh, I think the government was quite, uh, was pretty competent in the first year of the pandemic across a range of fronts. Uh, but this year, we've seen the wheels come off uh, on a couple of important issues. Uh, and look, in terms of the vaccination program, yes, as you say, Ed, there's more focus on deals um, that some of the drug companies were offering last year. But if we sort of uh, just take a step, slight step back from that, it, it is clear that we lost the race for supply uh, in the middle of last year. That, that, uh, America and the, the UK in particular were buying up masses, masses of product. And, uh, and we did not at that point in time. One of the reasons we didn't is that we made a bet on the AstraZeneca uh, vaccination and also on our capacity to manufacture it domestically because we didn't want to be caught in the crosshairs of vaccine nationalism. So like all bets, it's great if it works, less great if it doesn't. Uh, and that's that's where that's where we've ended up in essence. Some of the supply issues have been ameliorated, but then there have been uh, well, we're, we're starting to quantify the risks associated uh, with the AstraZeneca jab. Oh, I think we're just losing Catherine a little bit. Sorry. 
Um, I think we've lost Catherine. Uh, that seems to be not coming through very well for me there. Um, so I might go to, we might come back to Catherine and I'll go to the first um, question here, which is from Linda Talberg, who says, in the past weeks, I've been on numerous webinars focused on climate action with farmers and leading business people, not exactly inner city greenies. And there seems to be an incredible level of frustration in these groups with the lack of coherent action from the federal government. And the question is, how long can the fringe of the coalition continue to obstruct the required change? Richie, I might come to you first on that one. Uh, indefinitely, it seems like, uh, you know, and the, and the same goes for the fringe in, in Labor. Um, you know, if the way a politician reads his, you know, his or her electorate is, is siding with the narrow interests of the fossil fuel industry, then they'll continue to agitate accordingly. Um, but the plus side is that the international pressure will continue to build. And there's a good reason why the G7, Australia was invited as a, as a, as a plus member. I mean, Australia's emissions are larger than the UK, larger than France, larger than Italy, all G7 members. There's a good reason why Australia is being targeted and this will continue. Uh, it's the same reason why Biden is looking at putting more pressure behind the scenes on Australia. And we know this is happening in Canberra as much as elsewhere. Uh, so hopefully, like at least the international pressure will bring this you know, into sharp Relief And there's a question as to whether the nationals will then cut a deal. Barnaby, I guess, has more capital to burn and a target for 30 years away being net zero by 2050 could actually be you know, a, a trap really for us uh, in terms of whether that's real climate action or not. Because if you're offering a, you know, an unaccountable target 30 years away versus whatever else it is that Barnaby might be wanting, um, then it could be something that we, we need to watch out for. And instead, we should be focusing maybe on short-term action um, which we see from the essential media poll is actually more popular, like switching to renewables, building manufacturing opportunities. Mm. Uh, Catherine, we lost you for a minute there, but the question was around how long can the fringe of the coalition continue to obstruct change when you've got groups like Farmers for Climate and others, you know, who really do see the need for that change? Uh, yeah, sorry, guys, my internet can be a bit unstable during sitting weeks, so let's just all cross our fingers and toes. Um, look, uh, the, how long? How long can it go on? It can go on endlessly. As long as it, as long as it remains an election-winning formula for the coalition to carve up the country into and, and speak to sentiments in different parts of the country, it can go on forever. Uh, the only thing that will change the current dynamic I think myself is if uh, because at the moment what we've seen is uh, in if, if 2009 if that uh, sorry 2019 if that election is our prototype we saw swings to the coalition in marginal seats and safe seats in central Queensland we saw swings against the Liberal Party in safe seats in the metropolitan areas but because the safe Liberal seats in metropolitan areas have very large margins, the Liberals are not losing seats. Zali Stegall is the only exception to that rule. So the Liberals can basically put on their crash helmets, not love it very much, but go along with the, the, the weaponisation campaign because they're not losing seats. Until the Liberal Party loses seats in their heartland, in their metropolitan area, as a consequence of failing to act on climate change, this dynamic can, will go and will likely go on for a long time. Mm. Just to be honest about that. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Tim O'Loughlin, who says there's been support for incentives for electric vehicles by state governments recently, and the federal government has a pretty much anti-EV pro hybrid future fuels strategy. That's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, will international pressure and pressure from the states, particularly New South Wales, lead to a federal policy pivot in the future? Richie, I might come back to you for that one. Uh, yes, is the short answer. Uh, so the New South Wales government, the New South Wales coalition government has just put forward a really impressive package, like a lot of incentives and a long delay time before any EV tax. This is very different to what the, Vic the Victorian Labor government has done, which is lead with an EV tax and then try and soften it with a little bit of incentives on the front. 
Uh, South Australia will announce its approach today. So it's a real mixed bag. But at the federal level, uh, a vacuum of leadership has led to this mixed approach from all the different states, including here in the ACT, which is also quite positive on the EV front. The good news is the change is coming regardless. You know, Australia is a car taken on a car maker. Most car manufacturers are moving to electric vehicles. And the incentives that the ACT and the New South Wales government are putting forward will bring more affordable EV models here. That will drive more uptake. And that's what's probably going to lead to more of the change. The federal government has taken a, a political position against EVs. It used it tactically during the last federal election. But we know from modern liberals that there's nothing that, you know, they're not against EVs per se. Uh, it's just that that was the political play. And now the legacy of it is that they can't take any position that's actually being constructive in bringing that forward. But the change will come in a sense, regardless of what the federal government is doing by states that are leading and by manufacturers that are going to bring the change on regardless. Pete, is there anything you wanted to add on EVs? Have you looked at that in the past? Um, not in great detail. I, I, I'll go back to the previous question. The, the only thing I want to add to that, um, and I totally take um, Richie and Catherine's point that um, the, the, co the, the, the National Party can continue with their position forever. I do think that the global context will change the question we're trying to solve. And I think the other thing is, particularly with a lot of regional communities, there is another big change going on post pandemic, which is a shift of people from the cities to the regions. And I think that will not have an immediate electoral impact, but the, the, the idea that it's just old people staying in, in country seats and young people moving to the cities, which is almost like concentrating conservatism in enclaves, I think there is going to be a demographic shift back the other way um, with different priorities, but also different economic models. You know, the, the real challenge to all of these regional communities was the mine was the anchor industry. The challenge is just to create other anchor industries that, that, that recognise the specific places they're operating in, the traditions they're in, not telling people in the old industries that we don't need you anymore or you're part of the problem, but just developing plans to create thriving regional communities. And in that context, there, there, there's got to be a way forward because just holding the door shut decade after decade after decade, just at some point that the damn walls are going to bust. Yeah, Catherine, how much does that, uh, you know, ruin the weekend comment? Is that going to hang around the Liberals' necks for a while or do you suspect they will start to move on this? No, I agree substantially with what Richie said in terms of the, the main problem uh, prohibiting or, or, or making action complicated at the federal level is the whole war on the weekend nonsense. It's very, that is a very hard campaign to back off. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it is quite difficult for them to stand up and say, actually, the opposite is also true. Uh, but I also think that um, Rich is right in, the, in that area in particular, uh, particularly that's just going to be a consumer revolution that, that comes over the top uh, once the technology, the cost curve of the, of the technology comes down, ch cars get cheaper, batteries get cheaper. Um, I can just see in the, some of the chat just how depressed I made everybody by my endless um, comment on the Nats. So I just say one point in amelioration, I genuinely believe what I said. And I, and I think that we can waste a lot of time by not being honest about that. So I think it's very important to be very clear about that. Mm. But I also think one thing that has the potential to change, Pete's point about um, the sort of mixing of metro and regional populations is an interesting one, but that is a long-term proposition. The thing that's been absent in the debate in Australia, we've spent 15 years talking about the cost of action in, in, in highly pantomimish and ludicrous form in, in various manifestations. We've been obsessed with the cost of action. It is about time that we started talking about the cost of inaction, which is the bigger cost that we face now. Our, our trading region has basically clicked over into a net zero region. This global capital has made its choice. It's, it's done. It's already done. So the proposition before Australia at this point in those regional areas is, are you part of the future or are you stranded? Mm. And it's not... It's, 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 it's a much bigger issue than the impact on regional areas. This is, we are a fossil fuel intensive economy. If we do not lean into the new energy economy, we are stuffed. It is that simple. So 
there needs to be more galvanising efforts around the, the political class to start to bring these issues to the fore, because this is not a seminar, this is not a drill, this is our future. And the well-being of you know, our kids materially, as well as in a sustainability sense, is genuinely on the line. And it's on the line in this decade. And people need to start talking about the cost of inaction. Otherwise, this debate never changes. Mm, not just the cost, I guess, in terms of the climate change impacts, but like you've said there, missing out on all the opportunities of um, decarbonising the economy that everyone else will get in on first. Um, the next question that I've got is a bit out of, uh, not left field, but not the subject of the Guardian Essential poll. Catherine, I might come back to you. We are on the left field here, Ebony. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, it's from Michael Goodman who asks, uh, do you have any observations on the East Timor ASIS spy trial, the Witness K trial just concluded in Canberra? Uh, look, we've done some really good work on this trial, but I'm embarrassed to say to the questioner that it's, it, it's been so frantic over the last week and a half that I haven't digested the, the ins and outs of the court proceedings. I'm sure I would have very strong views had mm -hmm. I read uh, my colleague uh, Chris Norse's very uh, important uh, journalism on this front, but I, I'm not going to wade in because I'm just not uh, as across as, as I should be. Yeah, no worries. Um, well, I might just add that, uh, you know, a, a, a whole amount of that trial was held uh, in secret and uh, still Witness K's lawyer is facing some pretty awful charges. Uh, so it is one that's really concerning for freedom of speech, for the protection of whistleblowers. There's a, a huge number of really uh, concerning things thrown up by that trial. And um, yeah, I think uh, the result there uh, is probably perhaps one of the best ones that Witness K could have hoped for after pleading guilty with a suspended sentence, but that really doesn't ameliorate any of the actual concerns about the protection of whistleblowers and the government's behaviour and no one actually being held to account for spying on an ally, essentially. So a good question, and I would thoroughly recommend that people head over to Guardian Australia and read some of Christopher's um, coverage of it because it, it is a very uh, consequential trial and still has a ways to go for Bernard Caleri. Uh, I've got a lot of questions here about um, the prospects of Labor, which we get at every poll position. Um, we've talked a little bit about the rump of the coalition. Um, I might just add a note of optimism about uh, the Nationals and note that um, it's not always just Liberal seats at risk, but I believe in the past over the issue of coal seam gas, uh, there's a couple of national seat that fell to the Greens at the state level, went from Nats to Greens. We've also got the Voices um, independent style campaigns uh, cropping up in places. But Pete, I might come back to you about Labor's prospects um, at the election, whether or not Albo's cutting through. What are your uh, thoughts there? What comes through from the polling? I think it's very winnable. I think that it's not a usual political cycle in the sense that last year Labor um, kept its mouth shut for a, a year, which was exactly the right thing to do um, when you're in the middle of a global pandemic. I think the only test for an opposition last year was, would you be such a pork chop that you are never entitled or you've ne you will never be leader? And a few state oppositions obviously met that challenge. Um, Labor didn't. Um, the challenge I think now for Labor is both a micro and a macro one. The macro one is to create the, the, the argument for change. Um, I think that there is a whole bunch of immediate um, failings of administration that builds that case. And also a sense that in this government and particularly in the prime minister, you've got a leader that um, has a great veneer, but doesn't always follow through. I think the challenge for Labor is, as I think we said last time, is to, to build up um, its leaders' credentials to sort of match um, Morrison as a more authentic version of um, somebody that has worked their way up through the system um, and then identify a series of issues that needs to include energy transition but should not be confined to that, um, that will get different groups of voters excited enough to say, okay, there is a reason 
to change course. This will be the fourth term if the coalition get up. So it's now, it's not a new government. I think because there keeps being a change of leader, it feels like it's the first electoral test. This will be the fourth term, which, you know, is a long time in power. It was as long as Howard was in power, four terms. And we know how, how all that ended. So I know there's a lot of people on the left that go, oh, he's not cutting through. Oh, it's unwinnable. It's totally winnable. The polling numbers, we don't put out the horse race, but and I think we're a little bit stuck in because it wasn't 100% on the money last time. We don't believe polls anymore. All the polling says it's competitive. Um, I think the, the environment says it's competitive. So I, for those that are exercised in politics, I, I, I don't think it's a time to lose faith or get too downhearted. Mm. Uh, Richie, this next one's for you. It's from Andrew Farron. He says, do you have confidence that an EU-style carbon border, border adjustment mechanism would meet WTO obligations and it could have uneven effects and hence be discriminatory? Um, can you just comment a little bit and maybe just explain to people what a carbon border adjustment mechanism is? Sure, that's a good place to start and it's a good question. Uh, so a carbon border adjustment mechanism or CBAMs, uh, as we call them, is really uh, basically when, when your economy has some form of a carbon price or you know, find some way of, of basically charging carbon pollution. And then as a way of ensuring equity or a, a fairness for those polluters taking on that carbon price puts a tax on its borders for any goods coming in uh, and taxes those goods based on the carbon embedded within those goods or used to make those goods. So it's basically about equalizing things so that everything that comes in that economy faces a similar carbon price. As a result, it will most likely be compliant. It's not a tariff. It's not used to protect locally made goods by making foreign goods more expensive. It's an equalizer. Um, that's why it's called a carbon tax or a carbon border adjustment. It adjusts things to make it the same. And therefore, according to the former World Trade Organization chief, Pascal Lamy, the WTO rules are a compass, not an obstacle to actually bringing forward a carbon border adjustment mechanism, a CBAM. So it's unlikely that the Europeans, the largest trading bloc in the world, would actually do something that would fall foul of the WTO. Instead, they'll use it to make sure it complies and we'll find a way to prosecute it more broadly. So it'll be really interesting on the 14th of July to see what they bring forward. The Australian Institute has written up a, a pretty comprehensive paper around the position of most G7 economies on CBAMs, what export goods will be impacted. And for Australia, the majority of that impact will come down to alumina and aluminium. So Australia's aluminium smelters are carbon heavy. They're mainly made for export. And, and as a result, Australia really should be leaning into this conversation, shaping a CBAM, not claiming it's protectionist, and should at the same time hedge its bets, make sure that its, it's exported goods are actually cleaned up, are greened up now in case the CBAM comes forward, especially uh, amongst those trading partners in the North Asia. Catherine, I might finish up with you there. Uh, what are the chances that we are going to engage with this properly or are we just going to stick our head in the sand and hope it all goes away? The, the C-ban. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I, I think there's a fair amount of hope it all goes away. Um, but no, I think uh, we're like the Australian government hasn't got the luxury of thinking that this will all go away. The Australian government is actively, you know, working through what implications this has for for us uh, in the event that it proceeds. I'll just pick up one point uh, uh, that, that, is, um, that is sort of a bit in the weeds, but kind of interesting. Um, just that point Richie made about us uh, not shaping the conversations uh, of, being, of being one step removed from them and, and sort of just in the don't do this to us mode. Uh, that is something that, that does cause some anxiety around the government uh, because We've had this position over the last decade or so where Australia has actively uh, worked against the cause of international climate action that uh, unusually in terms of our middle power open economy status, that we are not sufficiently at the table anymore in order to shape some of the rulemaking around abatement and, and around trade. So um, I think that's, it's a totally boutique point, and I, forgive me for boring you with it, 
but it is really important that we are, because Australia is often at the table in those sorts of discussions and transactions because we are an active middle power and the open economy has benefited Australians. So we are often present, but we are not present sufficiently in the climate discussions. And I know in, in some reaches of the National Party, that, is, that has caused some anxiety. It's sort of like, oh God, you know, there's a deal now coming down the pike that we, ca we perhaps can't ameliorate in Australia. We can't try and soften the edges of it because we're not even at the table. So it's actually quite an interesting thought experiment. That quite the dilemma. We're going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone, for your good questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. Thanks to our guests, Catherine Murphy, Pete Lewis, and Richie Merzian. Uh, we do have more exciting webinars coming up with author Bree Lee about her new book, Who Gets to Be Smart, with the former Swedish Foreign Minister, Margot Wallström, uh, about feminist foreign policy. I think that's going to be a great one. She's written a chapter for the new uh, Nordic Edge book that's coming out very soon uh, with several chapters written by Australia Institute staff, including moi. So please uh, check that out. And we've got uh, some more interesting webinars coming up with Chanel Contos, uh, Rex Patrick, amongst others. So do head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to check those out. Thanks very much, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you next week and for the poll position the week after that. Cheers, and we'll see you soon. Bye.